This lecture is part of an online undergraduate course on complex analysis. So this is a sort of introductory lecture, so I'll just give a quick survey of some of the things complex analysis covers. So first of all, complex analysis is pretty similar to real analysis, except that it works with complex numbers of the form a plus i y, where x and y are real, and i squared is equal to minus 1. So, so just as we represent numbers on real numbers by putting them as numbers on a real line, for instance we have 0, 1, 2, and pi will be somewhere over here, we represent complex numbers as elements of a plane. So the complex number x plus i, y, we represent as the point x, y of a plane. So for example, the number i would be up here, and this would be 2 plus i, and so on. Um, so the um, numbers that are multiples of i are called the imaginary axis, and the multiples of real multiples of 1 are just called the real axis. Um, a lot of complex analysis is really pretty similar to real analysis. So we have the usual um, arithmetic operations for complex numbers. We can do exponentials. We can do trigonometric functions. We can do differentiation and integration. And many of the rules for real analysis work just as well for complex analysis. We can also do things like take limits, and we can sum series, and so on. So um, what I'm going to do now is, is to mention some of the differences between complex analysis and real analysis. So the first obvious one is that trigonometric functions and exponential functions turn out to be almost the same. Um, so there's a very famous identity due to Euler, which says that e to the i x is equal to cosine x plus i sine of x. And using this, we can write all trigonometric functions in terms of exponential functions. For example, cosine of x is equal to e to the i x plus e to the minus i x over 2. And this saves a lot of labour because all the complicated identities for trigonometric functions that no one can ever really remember all turn out to be special cases of identities for exponential functions, so there's a lot less to remember. Um, so the second difference is, um, suppose we've got a real function. Um, so suppose we've got a function that looks like this. Suppose it might be 0 for x less than 0, and it might be y equals x squared for x um, less than 0. Now we can take the derivative of this function, and its derivative is still 0 down here, and it's linear up here, and it's not differentiable here. So there are some functions we can differentiate once, and some we can differentiate twice, and some we can differentiate three times, and so on. Um, for complex analysis, there's, there's no analogue of this. So for complex functions, so these would take the complex numbers to the complex numbers. So if it's differentiable once, it's automatically differentiable twice. And if it's differentiable twice, um, you can apply the same argument and show it's differentiable three times and so on, so you can differentiate it any number of times. And this is really bizarre if you're used to um, real analysis. You seem to be getting something for free, that somehow just insisting a function is differentiable once, that, 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 that doesn't seem to be any obvious reason why it should be differentiable twice. Um, so, um, you know, it's a sort of example of you say you can't get a free lunch. Well, sometimes in complex analysis you can get things for free. Um, so differentiation behaves better for complex functions. Um, now let's look a bit about integration. So um, suppose we want to integrate from 0 to 1 of f of x dx. Now if you're integrating real numbers, you're integrating from 0 to 1, and there's only one way to go from 0 to 1. Just go along like that. So 
it's clear what this integral is meant. On the other hand, if we're integrating in the complex plane, so here is one and here is i from zero to one, there seem to be a lot of different ways you could go from zero to one. So we could either go along like that, or we could go like that, or we could go like that, and so on. So the integral from zero to one seems to depend on which path you take. Um, well, it turns out that it almost doesn't. So we, we have Cauchy's theorem, which is one of the central theorems of complex analysis. So the integral from zero to one of f of x dx is almost independent of the path we take from zero to one. Um, actually, there are some cases when it does depend on the path, but we'll discuss this later. So this applies to functions f that are differentiable. It certainly doesn't apply to all complex functions. Um, so this saves an awful lot of trouble because we don't have to specify the path of integration, or at least, um, well, up to, up to the minor problem that we will discuss later. Um, and this turns out to be incredibly useful because um, in real analysis, there are various integrals, like the integral from zero to infinity of sine x over x dx, and various sums such as one over one squared plus one over two squared plus one over three squared, and so on, which you don't learn how to evaluate in ordinary introductory calculus courses. Um, in, in fact, um, sine x over x is one of these functions where you can't write down an explicit elementary formula for the integral. So the integral from 0 to x of sine x over x dx just can't be written explicitly in terms of elementary functions. However, it turns out you can evaluate the integral to infinity explicitly. It turns out to be pi over 2. And again, you don't learn how to evaluate sums like this in most introductory analysis courses, um, and most techniques you learn there just don't work, but this turns out to be pi squared over 6. And we're going to see how to work out both of these using complex integration. And this may be a little bit surprising because neither of these, this integral and this sum don't have anything to do with complex numbers at first sight, but it turns out that complex integration gives a way to evaluate series and sums like that. Um, next we have the phenomenon of analytic continuation. So suppose Um, I give you a function um, on zero or, or on the interval zero to one, and I might give you a real differentiable function, and the function might look like this. It might look like zero up to a half, and then it might look like a parabola from a half to one or something like that. So we've got a differentiable function. And now I'm going to ask you to calculate its values, and I'm going to ask you to calculate its value at the point minus one. And this is a completely stupid question, because if I tell you the function between 0 and 1, there's just no way you can evaluate it at minus 1. I mean, it's, you could guess maybe it continues as 0, or maybe it continues um, like that, or whatever. Um, we, we, we just have no real information about its value at minus 1. However, for complex functions, if I give you a function on the interval from 0 to 1, and it's differentiable, um, it's automatically determined in any connected region. So, so a function on, say, 0 to 1 is determined uniquely on any larger open connected set. And that's provided the function is a complex differentiable function. Um, and uh, again, we seem to be getting something for nothing. I'm only telling you a function on, say, the interval 0 to 1 or on some small region, and somehow this magically determines it on, on a much larger region. So there's a very famous or possibly notorious example of this, which is the Riemann zeta function. 
So this is one of the most famous functions in mathematics. It's denoted by zeta of s is 1 over 1 to the s plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. So for example, zeta of 2 is the series I mentioned earlier. It's 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on, which is pi squared over 6, as we will see later. Um, and this is possibly the single most notorious function in mathematics, um, in particular because of the Riemann hypothesis, which says all zeros of zeta of s are either real or have real part a half. So let's draw a picture of this. So here's the complex plane and here's the point zero and here's the point one and here's the point i. And the Riemann zeta function um, has all its zeros, well it's, it's got a few zeros at minus two and minus four and so on that we won't worry about. But there's the so-called critical line which has real part a half and imaginary part then. The, the claim is that all zeros of the Riemann zeta function lie on this pink line apart from the ones there. Well, uh, the problem is the Riemann hypothesis makes no sense at all because if we try and evaluate this, this only converges if the real part of s is greater than 1. For example, if s is equal to 1, we get the series 1 plus a half plus a third and so on which is equal to plus infinity. And you can easily check that the function only converges in this region here. And so it's not even defined um, for um, numbers with real part a half, no, n n never mind whether or not it vanishes there. Um, well, it turns out that the, the Riemann zeta function can be analytically continued. In other words, there's only one differentiable complex function that extends the zeta function to the whole complex plane, um, except at the point one where it definitely goes wrong because of this. Um, so so the, 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 even stating the Riemann hypothesis requires this concept of analytic continuation where you define a function in one place and it's kind of magically defined in some completely different place. Um, you may ask, why should people care about the Riemann zeta function? Well, it turns out that it zeros somehow magically control um, prime numbers, which is a bit surprising because at first sight this doesn't seem to have anything to do with primes. So if we draw the prime numbers on the real line, we, we get prime numbers 2, 3, 5, and 7, and so on. And they, they, they sort of seem to be kind of randomly positioned. If you look at them on a very big scale and look at the primes, you, you, you see that there are some regions where they're kind of dense and some regions where they're less dense. So um, you can think of this as being something like a sort of a compression wave. Um, you, know, you know, a sound wave, the, the air molecules are a little bit dense in some regions and a little bit less dense in others, and that's why you can hear sounds. Well, primes on the real line are a bit like that too. They, have, they, they, they form sort of compression waves in the same way that air can form compression waves. And this is actually quite a small effect. The, um, I, I've exaggerated in this diagram. Re really, primes are only very slightly denser in some regions. And Riemann discovered that these pressure waves, or the, the, these waves in the primes, had certain very precise frequencies. And the frequencies turn out to be the imaginary parts of the zeros of the zeta function. And the amplitude of each wave, in other words, how loud it is if you listen to it, turns out to be the real part of the zero. So the Riemann hypothesis say, says that the primes have a lot of waves going through them in terms of their density, and all these waves have in some sense the same amplitude or the same loudness, same volume or whatever. Um, OK, the, the final example I, I want to discuss is complex dynamics. And um, this is related to what is possibly the most famous planar set of all, um, which is the Mandelbrot set that I've got a picture of here. 
Um, so um, we can ask, well, what is the Mandelbrot set? Well, the Mandelbrot set is, is given as follows. You, you, you take a complex number and um, you keep on applying the transformation z goes to z squared plus c, where, where, where we're going to fix c. And we start at 0, and um, let's, let's call 0 z0, zero, and then we go to z1, where z1 is equal to 0 squared plus c. And then we go to z2, which is z1 squared plus c. So we keep on iterating this. And we can ask whether this sequence is bounded. Um, and this obviously depends on c. So if this sequence is bounded, this is the same as saying that c is in this Mandelbrot set. So it's got a very simple definition. However, the Mandelbrot set turns out to be one of the most it's just kind of amazingly intricate. So here, for example, um, is um, a picture of a close-up of the Mandelbrot set here. I've magnified it a little bit. And you can see it's getting incredibly intricate. And it gets even more intricate as you zoom in. Um, in fact, if you look around on, on YouTube, you can see various videos of people zooming into the Mandelbrot set by a factor of 10 to the 100 or 10 to the 1,000 or something. And it just keeps on getting more and more complicated. Um, so um, the, 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 this set has an incredibly simple definition. I mean, you can write down this definition in just one line, and yet it has this extraordinary complexity. Um, so um, that's the end of the summary. Um, I'm just say that I'm not following any particular textbook for this. Um, if you want to pick a textbook on complex analysis. There are loads of really great textbooks, and most of them will do. If you want to check whether the textbook on complex analysis is good or not, there's a very simple test. What you do is you check to see if it's got a section on the gamma function and a section on elliptic functions. Um, if it has, then it's probably a perfectly good textbook. If it hasn't, then the author doesn't really understand complex analysis because gamma functions and elliptic functions are where complex analysis starts to be fun. And if an author has missed those out, then I don't know, it's, 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 it's like buying a book on music by somebody who's tone deaf. Um, if you have no idea what book to get, I'll just recommend one. Um, there's this old classic book, which is Complex Analysis by R4s, which covers everything in the course. But as I said, I'm, I'm not following this book. Pretty much any book on complex analysis would be fine if you, if you want a book to go with this. OK, so the next lecture, we will just be um, reviewing basic properties of the complex numbers and the complex plane.